So how many of you are here today because you love Jesus Christ? Now, it should be every hand raised, but, you know, there's this one Christian comedian that does this thing about hand raising, and uh, I just got to tell you this because it, it, it hits me as really comical, that he starts off and he says, uh, any, any, any Baptists in the group? And, uh, and if you watch it, he, sa- he stands there and he goes like this. If you're a Baptist, you're sitting here going, I'm trying to raise my hand, but it just won't come up. You know, it won't get up here, you know. Anyway, uh, I'm just giving you a hard time. I know some of you are like, yeah, I'll sit here and agree with him and I won't raise my hand. And that's okay. You're in a Baptist church. You can get away with that. We understand. Uh, <laughs> but most of you are here today because you love Jesus Christ, right? I would, I would say that uh, probably everybody is here today because you love Jesus Christ. And, and yet, how many of us have struggled this week with being confident that we are living in a loving way towards our Savior? How many, would you, would you agree with me that a lot of us have struggled with that confidence that I've lived this week loving my Savior? Right, you, you, I, I, now I'm getting the head nods. I ain't getting no hand raising. <laughs> I was like, I ain't gonna raise my hand, not in public, and admit that. But I'll, I'll, I'll sit here and go, uh huh, yeah, I struggled with that this week. Well, let's let's look together at the book of First John, where I think we will find uh, some encouragement this morning. So last week we looked at First John chapter five, and we started in verse one. Let's, let's read where we were at chapter last week, starting in verse 1, and then we'll go into um, chapter 5, verse 6, which is where we'll be uh, looking this week. So 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey his commands. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. Now his commands are not a burden, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. And who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now last week when we, we, we kind of synopsis that, looking at the uh, illustration of what it takes to be a U.S. Marine and how they are prepared as 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 prepared as humanly possible to go into hand-to-hand combat. And that any Marine that has gone through all the training and has been in battle would say that the, the training was not a burden because of what it prepared them for. They would say that they were thankful for it. And yet if you went and asked them in the middle of that training, do you want to be training today? Most of them would say, no, I don't want to be training today. And yet they would look back and say, no, it wasn't a burden. Without that, I wouldn't be alive. And so it is with Christ that because his commands bring us life, that yes, there are moments in our walk with the Lord when the commands of the Lord are not the easiest choice to make and yet because they always bring life they are never a true burden and we will always look back and say I thank God for those choices I thank God for giving me the wisdom I thank God for leading me the way he wanted me to go so now we come in He says, but it finishes up, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who conquers the world. So verse 6 starts, Jesus Christ, right? If you believe he is the Son of God, let's talk about Jesus Christ. He is the one who came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. If we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater, because God's testimony that he has given about his Son, I'm sorry, because it is God's testimony that he has given about his Son, the one 
who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within him. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God had gi has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. We'll stop there for today. This passage has caused a lot of unnecessary confusion for a lot of Christians. Because we look at it through 20th century American eyes. You say, what other eyes are we supposed to look through it? Look at it through. These are the ones that I've got. This is where I live. Actually, 21st century now. Right? So here we have our perspective. This is where we live, right? And say, well, how am I supposed to look at it differently? Well, how did they read it back when God wrote it? When, back when John, through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, wrote the book of 1 John, how would the readers have read this? I don't believe they would have been confused at all. You see, he says, Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood. We struggle with this because in our culture, when we think of water, as a Christian, we think of baptism. Because the Christ was baptized in water. Yet, if you were a first century believer and you heard of somebody coming by water, you would have naturally thought their childbirth. Because that was a reference to somebody's birth in that day and age. For someone to come by water. Look, at, look with me at the uh, book of John. Let's see. John chapter 3. Starting in verse 3. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Here Christ says you have to be born of water. He uses the social phrase that explains someone's natural childbirth. And then he goes on and defines it for us by saying whatever is born of flesh is flesh. A natural childbirth is being born of flesh. To be born of the Spirit is not flesh. So whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he says, do not be amazed that I told you you must be born again. And then he uses another easily, a culturally understood example. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound. The wind was a reference to the Holy Spirit. And just like you know where the wind is at, even though you cannot see the wind. Are you always familiar with the famous poem, Who Has Seen the Wind? I had to study that when I was in school. I, I forget which famous author wrote it at this point. But you, we don't see the wind, but we know its effect. And so it is with the Spirit, which is why the Spirit was compared in, to the wind. And the wind was used as an illustration to define the work of the Spirit. So it says, The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So with everyone born of the Spirit. So here Christ defines this cultural, under, culturally understood method of referring to childbirth, to be born of water. So in 1 John, John simply uses what Christ used earlier when talking to Nicodemus, which would have been easily culturally understood. He said you, uh, he, is, he came by water and blood, not water, not by water only, but by water and blood. So Christ was born as a human being. He knew what it was to be a human, but he also came 
by blood, he came to shed his blood. He came through the blood of the Lord. He wasn't conceived by man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. The Spirit was there at Christ's conception. The Spirit was there at Christ's birth. The Spirit was there at Christ's death. The Spirit testifies to this truth. And so the Spirit, there are three that testify. The Spirit testifies. He was there. The water, the natural childbirth, testifies because Christ lived. We know he lived. And because he shed his blood, the blood testifies that his testimony is true. So there are three things that bear witness to Christ, and they are all in agreement that the word of God was fulfilled in the Messiah. So it says, if we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given us, he has given about his son. Now, when we think of the testimony thing, let's look at scripture. Deuteronomy 12, uh, 17 highlights the Old Testament's expectation of testimony. If you look at Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 2, if a man or woman among you in one of your towns that the Lord your God will give you is discovered doing evil in the sight of the Lord, your God, and violating his covenant, and has gone to worship other gods by bowing down to the sun, moon, or all the stars in the sky, which I have forbidden. And if you are told or hear about it, you must investigate it thoroughly. If the report turns out to be true that this detestable thing has happened in Israel, you must bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing and stoned them to death. No one is condemned to die. I'm sorry, no one condemned to die is to be executed. I'm sorry, let me read that again, verse 6. The one condemned to die is to be executed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. No one is to be executed on the testimony of a single witness. The witness's hands are to be the first in putting him to death, and after that, the hands of all the people. You must purge the evil from you. So in order to have life or death giving testimony, it had to be confirmed by more than one person, and that person had to be willing to be the first one to condemn someone to death. But if you look at Matthew 18, Christ uses that same teaching in the New Testament. In Matthew 18, starting in verse 15, it says, If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two more with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. Here we have what is commonly known as the practice of church discipline and how we would approach a brother in Christ. So you're supposed to have everything established by more than one witness, even according to Christ's own words. And he says in verse 17, if he pays no attention to them, tell the church. But if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. I assure you, whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Again, I assure you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. You know, Christ was providing confidence to his disciples that when they had to deal with painful issues, when they had to deal with accusations, and they were gathered together for the purpose of honoring the Lord by confronting somebody's sin, that Christ would be with them every time. But Christ himself said, it should be in the presence of two or three witnesses. If it's not, if it's, if it's just one witness, you cannot practice this thing of, of social, uh, social 
pressure and removal of membership and, and, and you, know, you can't do that. And yet, even in his statement, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. I find this challenge that if somebody that claims to be an unbeliever comes to church, do we ask them to leave and not come back until they're a believer? No, we don't. Why? Because we believe that seeing the body work, seeing us worship God together, will have an impact on their understanding of who God is, right? And so because we believe that, we want them to see what this looks like. And yet when a brother hurts our feelings, when he sins against us, and when he doesn't repent in the way that God calls him to repent, what is our knee-jerk reaction? Well, just don't come back to church. I don't want to see you. I don't want you here. That's not what Christ said. He said, treat him like an unbeliever and a tax collector. So if you know someone's a sinner and they're not honoring God, it doesn't matter what they say with their lips. And yet that doesn't mean that we can say to them, you're not welcome because you're a sinner. God only wants the righteous in our church. If that were the case, not a single one of us would be here. <laughs> but Christ himself said that this must only happen with two or three witnesses. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12, 21, Paul says, I fear that when I come, my God will again humiliate me in your presence. And I will grieve for many who sinned before and have not repented of the moral impurity, sexual immorality, and promiscuity they practiced. This is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I gave a warning when I was present the second time, and now I give a warning while I am absent to those who sinned before and to all the rest. If I come again, I will not be lenient. Here Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, talking to them about sexual sin that existed in the church, makes sure that they are reminded that the truth of God's word still holds true, that this, this confrontation must be established by the testimony of two to three witnesses. Now this is significant when we come to the book of 1 John, because what Christ is getting at in chapter 5, and what we just read, he said, the, there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three that testify. And they're in agreement. You see, Christ's point is not just that he lived and he died and the spirit witnessed it and so this is what happened. His point is that according to God's law, which he has also quoted and which Paul has also quoted. According to God's established law, Christ's testimony must be accepted as true. It must be accepted as true. And then he says, if we accept the testimony of men... God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given us about his son. In other words, this whole concept that it had to be two or three witnesses came about men's testimony. It was written to men to establish on what level of testimony prosecution could be continued or established that someone's wrong could be made known. And here he says, if we accept it, that men's testimony is good enough for our judgment according to God's law, how much greater God's testimony is greater because, it, uh, I'm sorry, because it is God's testimony that he has given us, he has given about his son. You see, believing in the Son isn't just 
well, I believe the Bible and the Bible's good and the Bible's valuable and it's got good stuff and I'm, I'm learning and I'm thankful. And God's point here is that God himself has testified to the authority of the Son. So when the Son speaks, when the Son tells you what God expects of you, the Son has absolute authority to do so. And in the book of 1 John, what has God been, what is the theme that God has been hammering home over and over and over again from the first chapter through the end? It has been that God's love should change us so that, according to Christ, only two commands matter. This Christ who was established not just by men's testimony, but by God's testimony. That all that matters is that you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And that you, a new command that he gives, which Christ says in Luke, a new command I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you. So the significance of what God's saying here in 1 John is that these commands about love are given from the one whose testimony has been established by God himself. So there is no argument. There is nothing that we can say. The only proper response is simple obedience. And then he says in verse 10, The one who believes in the Son has this testimony with him. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The next week we're going to look at what that life is because verse 12 says the one who has the son has life. But the point that God's getting at here that, that this is the testimony that God has established and there is no arguing because it is established by three witnesses and it has come from, it is testified by God himself as part of those three witnesses so it should be more believable than any testimony that has ever existed in the history of mankind and that testimony is that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. It's simple. It's basic. But it's the most powerful truth that man has ever known or could ever known because it is the only truth that has been established on the testimony and witness of God himself. So do you have life? If you have the son, you have life. This life is in his son. This is the testimony that God has given us, that God has given us eternal life. Jesus Christ himself said, and this is life eternal, that I know you, I'm sorry, that they, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ that you have sent. Eternal life did not, does not begin the day you die. Eternal life begins the day you know the Messiah. If you know the Messiah, you have life. Jesus said in John 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, the book of John, chapter 5, starting in verse 30, he's speaking to the, uh, the Jewish leaders, and he says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies about me, and I know that the testimony he gives about me is valid. You have sent messengers to John, and he has testified to the truth. 
I don't receive man's testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. John was a burning and shining lamp, and for a time you were willing to enjoy his light. But I have a greater testimony than John's because the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. You don't have his word living in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. Yet they testify about me. And you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. I do not accept glory from men. I'm sorry, yeah, but I, I do not accept glory from men, but I know you that you have no love for God within you. I have come in my Father's name, yet you do not accept, accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe? While accepting glory from one another, you don't seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This whole book was written to point to the Messiah. The writings of the scripture, Christ said, right here, you would believe me because he wrote about me. Verse 39, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, yet they testify about me. The value in this book, the Bible, is that it points us to the Messiah. Aside from that, it brings no life. The Messiah is the life. The commands are not the life. The commands are supposed to point us to the Messiah. The better life that God offers to those who obey him is only real life if it's through the Messiah. Just because you have a Judeo-Christian ethic and your life is guided by Scripture does not mean you have the Messiah. The Scriptures point to the Messiah, and the Messiah says that the most important command is that you love God with all your heart. And the second most important command is that you love your brother as I have loved you. Love your brother as you love yourself. He says it differently in two different places in Scripture. And yet, how easy is it for us to hide behind the law that tells us what we want to hear about our own actions and tells us how easy it is for us to condemn others who don't agree with us. But when it comes to this love thing, well, it's just tough love. It's, it's just tough love. And as Christians who want to love God, who want to honor God, we are in danger of falling into the trap that the Jewish leaders fell into, that they thought that the eternal life was in the Scriptures. And they missed the Messiah. You see, the Messiah is eternal life. The Scriptures point to the Messiah. If you know the Messiah, you love the Messiah, you will find the Messiah in the Scriptures. Jesus' testimony is true. So he should be believed because his testimony is true. Are you believing the Messiah today? Are you doing what God has said in 1 John over, that he says multiple times over, to love your brother because you know God's love? If you're not, 1 John makes it very clear 
in 1 John 4, 20, he says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother, he has seen, cannot love the God he has not seen. And this is the command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. I'll, I'll wrap up with this simple, simple truth. Was it easy for God to show you his great love? Think about that. Was it easy for God to show you his great love? Was it easy? No. How do you know his love was so great? Because it wasn't easy. How do you know that your brothers and sisters in Christ love you? Is it because you get along and it's easy? No. It's because we love each other when it's not easy. And the only way that's possible because we know God's love first. I thank God that I get to worship with people that I know love God and that I know are working at loving each other. I hope that you find this truth encouraging. But if you're here this morning and you find this uniquely challenging, the only solution is to know God's love more. Because this whole idea of loving God and loving your brother the way God has loved you is based on knowing God's love. And I think that too often in our weakness, we throw our hands up before we turn to knowing more of God's love. So how can you know God's love more? How can I know it more? When we read the scriptures looking for the Messiah, which all of the scriptures point to the Messiah, we will know more of God's love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your truth this morning. And Lord, we ask that you would work through each one of us. And Lord, I am not in any way above anyone here. And so, Lord, each one of us needs you to work that your love would be seen. Your, Lord, your testimony is true. It cannot be denied. It is the most powerfully proven and attested to testimony in the history of the world. And so, Lord, when we believe your testimony and we understand your love, we will know what it means to love those around us and to respond with worship and love for you.